Welcome to this AgriVoltaics webinar. Um, for those of you who AgriVoltaics is a new concept, it's basically a term to, used to describe uh, dual land use, where we have farming activities um, happening whilst we have solar panels on the same site. So my name is Anna Vaughan. I'll be facilitating the uh, webinar today. And I was the project lead for the original Our Land and Water project that uh, Tumbo, Infratech and Victoria University of Wellington were involved with uh, and we, that we completed at the end of June. <clears throat> so yeah, like I mentioned, that project was brought to, um, brought to everyone by our land and water funding. Um, and today we've got a really high caliber of speakers. It's a really exciting afternoon uh, to have so many uh, experts all together on what is a relatively new topic for New Zealand. So I'll um, quickly do a broad introduction and then as we um, go through the webinar, I'll, each of the speakers can provide a bit more of an introduction. So firstly from Victoria University of Wellington, we have uh, th three representatives. So we have Professor Alan Brent. Uh, so Alan, who is um, just still um, hooking on with the Wi-Fi at the moment. He is a uh, expert in sustainable energy systems and um, works with the engineering faculty. We also have uh, Professor Catherine Irons and Olivia Granger, and they are from the uh, Faculty of Law. And so, yeah, really uh, privileged to have you uh, both here today. We also have Chris Service from Infratech. Um, Chris is the energy service company's market lead. And uh, just a brief back background of Infratech, I'm so, sure Chris will provide a better introduction. But Infratech is basically a uh, energy, um, a sustainable energy business and a solar developer. And then finally, we will have Ian Hyde from the Ashburton District Council speaking. Um, and Ian is a district planning manager. So he'll be able to talk to some of the uh, detail around those consent processes. So um, in terms of, of housekeeping for the webinar, um, you'll see that there is a Q&A option uh, in the um, pop-up screen uh, on your Zoom screen. We will use that for any questions. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge I've got my colleague Megan um, Fitzgerald who was um, involved in this project as well. She's doing all the behind the scenes uh, work today. And so she will be compiling those uh, questions and we will hold the questions until the end of the webinar. And then we'll have an open um, question and answer session at that point. So feel free to type in any questions at any uh, stage through the presentations and Megan will then collate them and we can um, address them right at the end. Yeah, so in terms of our schedule for the day, uh, I'll do a very brief up or overview really on the uh, Land and Water Agrivoltaics project that we've recently completed. Uh, we will then make a change from what's on our screen uh, just because we're having a few issues with Wi-Fi uh, and Chris Service from Infratech will then um, follow on from me. Uh, the legal team of Catherine and Olivia will um, speak to the legal considerations of, um, oh, sorry, the legal landscapes. Then uh, we're hoping to have Ian um, at that point talk about consent and planning impacts. And finally, um, depending on when Alan's able to join, he'll give a bit of a state of the nation of what's happening with agrivoltaics, both uh, here in New Zealand and globally. And we'll um, finish the session with questions. So in terms of um, the project that we completed, uh, basically uh, our land and water do a rural professional fund, um, which is allows rural professionals to take on a topic of interest that's relevant to farmers, get farmers involved, and, um, and pursue it. It's a short, um, usually six to nine month project. And so the topic of interest for me was the um, agrivoltaics. I was aware of the goal of for New Zealand to uh, move to 100% renewable energy. And 
conscious that there's a move also to the electric electrification of industry and transport. And so there's going to be greater demand for renewable energy. And so it's inevitable that we are going to have more solar panels, um, wind, other renewable sources of energy. Uh, coming from a farming background, I had some concerns about what that meant for our, our food production and, um, and the effect on that land use. So that got me really interested in are there options to change the way we approach solar that we can have this dual land use. And so that's where the, um, the I guess the idea for this project initially came from. As it turned out, it's not a new idea, um, as all of these experts here today can speak to. Uh, it is relatively new in terms of implementation here in New Zealand. So our key findings for the project, uh, our initial project was focused on Canterbury. However, uh, this webinar is applicable to um, all of New Zealand. And basically there are various sites around the country that are suitable for agrivoltaics, but it's all site specific and there are uh, factors, and Chris may speak to this um, to some extent, that make a site more or less suitable. So agrivoltaics does offer multiple potential benefits. We've got those uh, potential animal welfare benefits through the shade provision. We've got an overall uh, increase in lamp productivity. We were able to generate both energy and food from the same site. Uh, and in the example we did, where we did some financial modeling, we were able to show that uh, in the sheep and beef scenario, there's actually um, some real advantages in terms of additional revenue for some um, farming systems and solar arrangements. The flip side of that is while it's um, happening overseas, there are a lot of unknowns here in New Zealand simply because there aren't a great deal of agrivoltaic systems in place currently. Uh, and so there is a lot more work needs to be done around just quantifying what some of these effects are, uh, whether it's past production, what are the effects on the environment um, and any ecological impact. So there, um, it's a new area. Um, and there is more, more work to be done. So one of our overall recommendations from this project was let's bring together farmers, developers, and um, legislators uh, now so we can get a plan in place so that we can optimise our land use. So uh, conscious of time, um, we won't, I won't go into a, a lot of detail today, but if anyone's interested in more information, we do have um, our project results on this project web page. Uh, we also ran a farmer workshop. So we did these farmer workshops back in March. And the idea with the farmer workshops was to get farmers in a room and to discuss their concerns, uh, what they see as the be potential benefits, risks, uh, and any barriers and constraints to adoption. So, uh, the farmers identified that a couple of solutions they would like to see was more information and accessible information on agrivoltaic in an Aotearoa or New Zealand context. And so that was the focus of that original project that we um, presented. The next um, point that was raised was that more information is needed um, regarding ownership partnership models and also the consenting and legislation side of things. And that's what um, the purpose of today's webinar is to, to address some of those concerns. So uh, with that in mind, unfortunately, um, Alan is having some issues with Wi-Fi. So we'll now um, skip to Chris. No, just yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Just while we pull up the slides, I I'm conscious that um, it's a shame Alan wasn't here for now, but I'm sure he'll fill in some of the blanks on the sort of broader context. But just to sort of uh, tease that uh, by means of an introduction, um, you know, uh, big picture is uh, yes, the world is decarbonizing. New Zealand has um, made some moves um, from a policy perspective, but 
Uh, ultimately, industry is really getting behind that now as well. And I, I guess to put some context to what we're talking about and why you're seeing the big rise in interest in solar farming and uh, and wind in New Zealand is that um, TransPower, the, the grid operation operator and system operator, are looking at effectively, I think it's a 70% plus or minus uh, increase in the electricity demand of the whole nation by 2050. Um, to put it in perspective, it's taken us over 100 years to get to this point, and um, now we're projected to effectively almost double it within the next 27 years. So it's a huge, huge uplift, and um, and the reality is of that you're kind of seeing in, in your pocket with um, electricity pricing definitely going through the roof for most commercial and industrials that we've been speaking to. Um, that's projected to unfortunately increase as we see um, EVs come on board, also de carbonization of process heat and a lot of the sort of rural uh, factories that you're you're probably somewhat aligned to um so hence why the opportunity is there and why this topic is so relevant so i'll leave it at that and hopefully alan can sort of speak to the broader global perspective about it. yes sorry chris um we've just had alan has managed to get back on are you comfortable if we skip to him just in the meantime yeah perfect from my side yeah, thanks, Anna. So uh, I guess you just need to uh, run the slide. Excellent. Yeah, just talking about uh, morning, everybody. Good afternoon, Ryder. Right? Um, sorry for joining late. A bit of technical issues here on Calvin campus. Uh, yeah, just wanted to give a bit of an overview, touching what uh, Chris uh, was talking to the global trends and and what's. What are the opportunities uh, for our country going forward? Next slide, I So I came in a bit late. So uh, as Chris said, really what's happening, and this is a chart uh, from the International Energy Agency talking about uh, what's happening in the renewable energy sector, as uh, Anna also alluded to. And it's really uh, solar PV is projected uh, over the next two decades to really grow virtually exponentially, um, and then we'll see increased capacity. Next slide. Yeah. And uh, if we look in our context, and this is a slide from, from Transpower, uh, in the uh, Marihiku uh, forecasting, yeah, they're talking about, just click, uh, again, I know this, this text, no? Yeah. We, their vision is about broader, greater, faster electrification. As uh, Chris was talking to, uh, we're going to be electrifying the transportation, uh, industrial heat, etc. And this is a, a study that uh, we've undertaken to look at what that forecast of demand can be in terms of capacity. And as you can see in the dark orange there, we expect over the next two decades for utility scale solar uh, to play quite a significant uh, role in the mix. Next slide, Anna. And this is already happening, right? So uh, these are figures and, 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 a, and a pie chart from a report of Concept Consulting for the Market Development Advisory Group. Uh, looking at what, what's actually happening at the moment, we're busy building an order of two gigawatts uh, of utility scale solar at, at the moment. Uh, we're actively pursuing uh, much more. Uh, here, different figures, six to eight gigawatts. So that's effectively uh, uh, doubling our capacity. Uh, if you consider that at the moment we have about nine gigawatts uh, of power capacity generation or power generation capacity in, in the mix, we're looking at, at doubling that with, with the solar power, uh, the utility scale of solar power. Next slide, Anna. And this is a real huge uh, investment opportunity for, for, for the economy. Uh, we're looking at about $15 billion. Uh, but there's an issue around land requirement um, you know, to uh, meet the current electricity generation capacity. We're going to need about 40,000 hectares of land. So that's about 2% of the land allocated to dairy farming. So there's the question of, is this potential competition for land, which is what this project uh, set out to investigate. So hence, uh, dual land usage is uh, increasingly considered across uh, the world. Forerunners in this uh, has been Germany, uh, France, Japan, 
And now increasingly in the, in the US as well, they have quite a number of uh, testing sites uh, around the country. Next slide, Anna. And yeah, all this uh, this slide is talking to is really taken off uh, on the right hand side there. Uh, uh, just a, a story around uh, uh, some of the academics in the US looking at some of the challenges uh, and possible solutions for the uptake of agrivoltaics. And if you look at the publications, you'll see on the left there just a little blip in 1981. That's when agrivoltaics was actually uh, coined as 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 a as a possibility and stayed dormant. And over the last 10 years, it's really taken off. And now there's even a dedicated agrivoltaics conference uh, annually. Next slide, Anna. And there's all kinds of benefits, uh, you know, in terms of added shelter for, for animals, heat stress, or to deal with heat stress. Uh, also in adverse uh, winter uh, conditions, um, increasing pasture-based systems performance, carbon offset for landowners, and really just additional income uh, from uh, electricity generation. And what this uh, graph at the bottom is showing, this is an agrivoltaic system in Germany, so we're looking at high the high latitudes, all right. So not an area of the world that we solar is that significant or that good. But you can see uh, with the consumption the, of the, of the farm there and uh, the, the gray bars, the yellow is obviously uh, what is generated uh, and self consumed by the farm. But then you can see the green there, what is actually fed back into the grid. All right, so just emphasizing that potential additional income from, from electricity generation. Next slide. Uh, so we have different uh, technology configurations here. Uh, starting on the left, we have what we call fixed tilt. So uh, those panels uh, are uh, tilted at a fixed angle, and these rows run east to west. So that for us, obviously, they'll be tilted towards the north. In the center there, we have what we call tracking systems. So these rows run uh, north-south. And as you can see in that uh, picture there, those panels then tilt from east to west to track the sun across the day. And then, uh, so that's what we call overhead systems, right? But on the right-hand side there, uh, with the, these bifacial solar panels, so these are panels that can generate uh, electricity from sunlight from both sides. Uh, we also have the option of vertical uh, panels if we don't want anything overhead. So different kind of conf configurations, looking at the farming uh, uh, operations and what, what might uh, suit best. So we did an analysis, uh, a GIS analysis, looking at solar resource across the country. Uh, we looked at other characteristics of the land, like for instance, the slope and how far it is from a transmission system and so on. And uh, everything you see there in red, that's good. That's potential potential land that can uh, be allocated to, to or where agrivoltaic tax systems can be um, uh, implemented. And it's vast, right? It's no, there, there's no, there's no lack of land, if I can put it that way, uh, if we're going the agrivoltaics uh, route. So thank you for that. Thanks very much, Alan, um, and pleased that you're able to join us then. So we'll move on now to uh, Professor Catherine Irons and Olivia Granger, and they're going to speak about the legal uh, landscape in, in regards to agrivoltaics. So I'll hand over now to uh, Catherine. I'm kia ora tato. Sorry, I was just getting my full uh, PowerPoint uh, slide up on the screen. So yeah, I'm a law professor um, at Victoria University um, School of Law, and I teach resource management, um, the Resource Management Act, and all the other environmental uh, statutes as well. And I have um, I'm also a practicing barrister and have worked in the Environment Court on, you know, consents and water conservation orders and things like that. Olivia Granger is a research fellow. Um, at the law school, and she's done a lot of the background work um, on this project um, that um, Alan Brent um, has put together. So what I've been asked to talk about 
it's more broadly the legal landscape that we have at present. Um, and I do have um, a screen I'm going to share, which has got the PowerPoint on. Uh, and um, the legal landscape, so obviously we have um, a planner that uh, Chris, um, is, no, Ian, sorry, is going to be talking about some of the aspects in more detail. So I'm going to provide an overview. It's almost like a bit of everything and then leave um, Chris to fill in the details, particularly about the national policy statements and the current consultations on those. So I am hope we I hope I've interpreted those right, but I'm saying that partly as a warning for Chris. Um, so the first point to note um, is that we still have the Resource Management Act. And we're going to have that for the next 10 years, even if we keep the, um, the uh, Natural and Built Environments Act and the Spatial Planning Act, which you know some uh, political parties have said they want to scrap by Christmas. So we'll wait and see what happens. I'm not going to deal with those, um, except to say that they will come in gradually as, for example, spatial plans might start applying an overlay to some of these rules. But so the key points are we still have the RMA, we still need resource consents. So um, in order to adopt an agri agrivoltaic, um, you know, array like you've got in front there, you're going to need the same old matters that you need for all your other resource consents, a description of the activities in detail, the site, how it aligns with the RMA and all the other relevant planning documents. What are all the environmental effects that need to be assessed? That will typically require lots of expert input, um, as you're no doubt used to, not just lawyers and planners, but also the landscape architects, ecologists, um, cultural advisors, the engineers in particular. And um, uh, the meaningful and effective consultation with all affected parties. And there's an increasing emphasis on local iwi and hapū, uh, um, even if, for example, you have an existing farm without much iwi and hapū involvement, it's there's a lot of um, re increasing requirements to take into account, for example, historical association with lands that might have been taken away in the past. So that is a direction on, uh, in which the country is going and the legal system's going. And so this is a matter of, um, I could say, proactively considering and providing information about those matters for a uh, consent authority. Um, so, and then part of that is we have the same policy framework at least in existence for now, and you will get advised when they start changing. Um, and at the top are these policy statements, the national policy statements that apply to all of the matters in front going down. We've got some key ones with the electricity generation and highly productive land, also the NPS on freshwater management. Um, and then we get the environmental standards, and there are two key ones mentioned there. They feed into regional policy statements, regional plans, and district plans. And what is key about um, those is there are national guidelines and national standards, but they're also filtered down to the local level such that everything is determined in terms of consents by what happens by the other things in your local council plans, local and regional. So for example, the second point here, activity status for, which is relevant to consenting, is going to change depending on what your plans provide. Um, at the moment, they're unlikely to provide specifically for agrovoltaics. Um, so therefore, uh, and so activity status is likely not to be specified, so a discretionary status will likely to apply. Most lawyers and applicants don't like discretionary status because it's the least certain. Everything's up in the air. Um, the council decision making, the consent authority, can make whatever conditions it justifies um, as relevant and reasonable uh, and can come to any decision it likes. So until, unless and until, uh, plans and policy statements provide for agrivoltaics, you um, typically have to provide more information in order to justify your result um, because there's less certainty. So then um, in terms of actually consenting, there are several elements in the consenting framework that are in favour of renewable energy generation. Um, that starts in with part two, 
of the RMA, where you've got specific requirements for decision makers to pay particular regard to renewable energy um, and particularly the benefits of renewable energy for climate change. Uh, at the same time, uh, while in consenting decisions, um, consent authorities do have to pay attention to part two, we also have the national policy statements being able to take priority, especially when they're clear and directive. And we start off with the NPS on renewable energy generation, and that was made in 2011. Actually, I'm going to put some more detail on the next slide, but um, we also have the 2011 for that one, so it's been applicable for a while, and now much more recent uh, 2022 National Policy Statement on Highly Productive Land. So I'll just go to those two as, again, a part of the framework. So in terms of a description, the NPS on renewable energy generation does have the obje explicit of objective of increasing um, renewable energy um, developments. And, you know, uh, like you've got pictures of solar, whether it's wind, solar, tidal, whatever it is, it has the objective of um, increasing it. And the, we have a current aspirational target um, for 100% renewable energy generation by 2030. So we um, we basically need to increase to that. And the needs will also be increasing. It's not a fixed ceiling in terms of an amount of energy, because as population grows and as more things are electrified, then the need for electricity is going to keep growing. So decision makers must pay particular regard to this need, but also these other things of locating um, renewable energy developments where the resources available, the logistical and practicalities associated with it, and the connection to the grid. Um, and regional policy statements, plans, district plans, they all need to um, be consistent with to basically uphold these uh, this national policy statement. The one difficulty with it at the moment, it was passed in 2011 before the current um, King Salmon framework. Um, I presume you know what I mean by that. This need where basically directive statements and national policy statements will override any more general um, and vague statements elsewhere. And uh, the difficulty with this one is it was drafted before many of those, uh, this need to be directive and clear, and it's currently undergoing an overhaul or well, a consultation period for, um, for change to make it more fit for purpose in today's environment. So I'm assuming um, that uh, Ian will be talking um, to that one. But this is the one we have at the moment, um, and it's the decision makers are taking it into account. So you have this on your side, for getting these projects through. Um, against that, <laughs> we have the National Policy Statement on Highly Productive Land. This was just um, brought in last year, and it is aiming, um, I mean, and justifiably so, aiming to protect highly productive agricultural lands for agricultural production um, for now and in, and in the future. And it's, it's, it's concerned particularly with maintaining the availability and productive capacity. It doesn't say you have to use it to the ultimate productive capacity, um, but some early decisions are applying this have uh, taken that approach. And so um, this also might, you know, th there are some uncertainties with it being so new, and that's one of the biggest difficulties with the consenting process. But in terms of complying with it, it must be mapped. You must map all highly productive lands um, in the region and the district. Uh, it must be prioritized um, and they must support those lands and they must be protected from, you see the quote there, inappropriate use and development. So the key will be what's inappropriate um, and it will be inappropriate if you're gonna interfere with that productive capacity unless you fit within an exception. And at the moment, the closest exception is the one that fits on the screen, an expansion of specified in infrastructure. But technically what we're doing, if you want to stick in a new, um, say, a solar array uh, on your farm, that's not an expansion of an existing one. It's, it's really stretching it to fit into that. It's a new um, array. And that's not really provided for very well. Um, that is one of those matters under proposal for change at the moment that I assume Ian's going to be talking about. But at the moment, uh, it's um, this has actually this has actually provided a barrier to the establishment um, or the consenting of 
um, uh, new agrivoltaics on, um, yeah, on farms. So I'll move to the next one. So the sixth point I wanted to comment on is notification. The first step in any consideration of a consent is the notification decision. No applicant wants full public notification. It means it takes a lot longer um, to uh, go through the consenting process. And with that comes expense, especially if you're being asked to pay for an independent panel, uh, whether it's one person or three, um, and the applicant pays for that. And so um, um, full, if the adverse effects are considered more than minor, then an authority will require full public notification. You may also require it if there are, quote, special circumstances that make it desirable, something unusual or exceptional. And of course, when, because you're inviting uh, comments from any member of the public on the application, and anyone who submits on it then has the ability to appeal it and further delaying your process. Uh, most applicants much prefer a limited notification, e.g. just to neighbours, and then you can go around all your limited affected people, you can get their consent in advance, um, get it in writing, and you don't then um, often have to have any notification if everyone who is deemed to be affected has already given consent in advance. Um, but I'll give you an example, um, I'm not, I, think, I'm not, I can't remember if it comes next, um, of this notification decision, which, um, yes, so um, there will be another one coming up, sorry, so it's not yet next, but I think it's number eight, point number eight is an example of where this um, uh, went array, <laughs> array, maybe. So my seventh point is looking at case studies to date, what have been the effects of agrovoltaics um, arrays uh, that have uh, been considered important. And you can see on the screen a whole list of them. Um, landscape and visual, particularly glint and glare, is considered. It may not be more than minor, which, you know, the, the, that's the threshold test, minor, you know, less than minor, more than minor. It may not be more, but they'll consider it. So you have to have evidence about it. Um, what's the rural character and the amenity? Um, are you changing the look of green fields as people drive by um, your farms? That is a consideration. There's, of course, temporary construction, operational noise um, and earthworks, any discharges, even if they're temporary through the construction. Um, a positive one on the renewable energy, um, electricity generation, uh, climate change, you have network resilience, that could be a positive. Biodiversity effects, there might not be many at all, um, but you have to consider them. Same with natural hazards, electromagnetic radiation, all of these maricultural values. Um, and going right down to fresh water, now this is actually usually a benefit, because especially if you're converting from a dairy farm to these low arrays, for sheep, then, then you don't get the um, nitrate effects from dairying. Uh, and so that actually has been considered a bonus. Um, and that's which why some people might be considering it for, you know, more marginal um, dairying lands. So here's an example, point number eight. Um, South Wairarapa, there has been a proposal you can see there on the, um, the, the picture, the lands outlined in red, um, I gather, uh, have been proposed um, by Far North Solar Farm Limited to put on arrays, and you can see 174 megawatts, um, 235 hectares. They'll have the maximum height 4.5 meters, but they're planning to only have one like the previous screen of having sheep um, around it. But they want to put up big shelter belts to um, around the edges uh, to shield it visually. And there's no other major features, but you know it is zoned rural with primary production, so it is it will be considered highly productive land. But where so far that's only got to a notification decision. Where this is relevant is they well, it's okay, it's discretionary, but they decided that it needed public notification because it would ha could have more than minor adverse effects in relation to landscape and visual and rural character. And why? I mean, we still got shelter belts with farms and they said, well, you know, it's it looks green. It looks rural. And they said there's two major changes. One of them, it's simply a change, right? It's simply a change, something new, right? It's going to change from being open. So there's the first one that's going to change. Second one's going to go from being an open view through, you know, um, uh, limited fences and not very many shelter belts uh, to these big hard 
um, green high shelter belts and then occasionally you might see um, some of the arrays. So and just simply because it was new um, like that, it would be a change they wanted public notification. It was the first. This is a difficulty you get when you go first. Um, if you were the 10th in the area, it wouldn't matter. It probably wouldn't be publicly notified at all. So this is one of those um, hurdles that the uh, groundbreakers need to come up against or need to overcome. Um, oh, so the special circumstance. Sorry, just more detail about the special circumstances. I don't, um, I don't need to write, read it all out, but it's this combination of everything being new was considered to be special such that it justified um, public notification. So the ninth um, point was, here's an example of one that has been approved. It was approved before the highly productive land national policy statement. Um, and it was approved under the fast track consenting. So, uh, which is, you know, uh, made it, uh, uh, you, yeah, you need a decent amount of information and other extra hurdles to be fast tracked, but they achieved that. This is a large, again, 260 hectares, 330,000 solar panels, which is quite a lot, um, sitting anywhere from sort of one meter up to three meters approximately above the ground. Um, and the idea again to have um, sheep grazing around, I gather. And plus is extra equipment and significant benefits, right, in terms of renewable energy, um, ecological benefits in terms of retirement of dairy farms. They also listed educational cultural opportunities um, for iwi hapu. Um, potential adverse effects during construction could be addressed and those adverse effects on rural character, I thought they would be addressed within four years once shelter belts had grown. So they weren't too concerned with the effects, interestingly. And um, what the panel commented was they were most impressed about um, the genuine engagement with uh, Iwi and Hapu who supported it for those socioeconomic opportunities. And there's examples there, supplying restoration plant species, involvement in landscape and plant maintenance, reducing energy hardship, um, increasing employment and future business opportunities. And the panel commented there on the right that its members have seldom observed a project that delivers such significant benefits with such comparatively few adverse effects. And these are experienced panel you know, consent commissioners. How, um, one of them was an environment court judge, um, at least one. Um, so how many energy is to be commended for the care it's taken in conceptualizing the proposal in the manner that it has? So this is helpful for if it, if you are involved and you haven't done this or, you know, if you're a planner and this is new to you, look at existing examples that have got through that have been commended. Um, and this is one of them. So if we go on to my final one, um, oh, there's a, a plan of um, panels. Um, a, this KEAX uh, limited the Selwyn District Council, which was decided in uh, March, um, that, that was a consent that was declined because it should have been notified and was not. So this is one to learn from the other way around, right? And the biggest difference, and this was actually where you learn from this is the information that was provided was insufficient. So you need to give them everything that they might want in order to be able to decide in your favor. So the consent was sought for an indefinite term, but the effects, the environmental effects, and particularly on the loss of um, productive potential of highly productive land, that was only considered for up to the 35 year term based on the lease term. And the panel says, yeah, but you want this indefinitely, or well, you've said you wanted it indefinitely, and we need information on highly productive land effects because of this new policy statement and you haven't given it to us. Um, so there's some more information, you know, this is, uh, looks like um, even bigger. Well, it's about the same size, 260 hectare site, um, and it's got the earthworks, but yeah, it's a lot of tables of solar panels. Um, it also has a Waihi Tonga management site, um, understood to be a, a shell midden, um, and that was addressed. But again, um, it's the highly productive land national policy statement in this case that scuppered this project so far. They just need to provide more information to resubmit. Um, so, and that's despite a large assessment of positive effects like the other one. Um, and so you see this quote at the bottom, I'm of the clear view that the proposal brings with it significant positive effects, which must be balanced when assessing the application. But despite that, there wasn't enough information on the highly productive soils and the productive capacity. 
So sorry about the uh, large amount of text there. The, if you look at the bolds, this piece of land is sufficient importance given its size and highly um, productive uh, land that the wider public has an interest in whether the restriction of the use of the site over the prolonged period um, will not be able to achieve its potential and whether that's acceptable. And again, at the bottom, ultimately insufficient evidence of the impact of the loss of the land in question for the district. So that there became a matter, a bit like the first one, a matter for the whole district, not just the neighbours, right? This matter of productive capacity is not just a matter of notifying to neighbours. The whole district has, and this is this now, this new highly productive land national policy statement makes it much more likely that you're going to need full public notification as a result. But again, it's a matter of, um, uh, so this, I think I think this is where I stop and we're going to have a lot more discussion pardon me, discussion about um, these national policy statements from Ian. So I'll leave it there and I'm very happy to take um, more questions about the, these consenting frameworks and examples. Kia ora tato. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, great to um, cover all that information. Um, I'll now qu quickly ask um, Chris to, uh, well, he's introduced himself once, but uh, he might like to um make a start on your presentation, Chris. Yeah, great. Happy to. Um, uh, just before I do, Catherine, that was really interesting. I love the examples. I mean, we, um, just for a um, data point for us, we've gone through two consenting processing processes in two district councils, same size, same design. One was um, a permitted activity and the other went to full public notification. So, yeah, there's plenty of, I guess, risk out there as a developer. Um, and so, yeah, pretty timely, I guess, these consultation pieces uh, are being looked at. Just a high-level overview of Infratech. Um, so we are, a, I guess, a, a specialist in the, in the field of renewable energy at large. Uh, in practice, that's, that's really solar and, and energy storage uh, in the New Zealand and Pacific Island context. We're owned by a community-owned trust as the ultimate um, owner uh, through Well Networks, which is a Waikato-based uh, lines company. So Poles and Wires is the core business. Um, we've been largely focused offshore for the last decade or so, um, building sort of solar and um, solar and battery microgrids in uh, remote locations from Afghanistan to Cook Islands, Tuvalu and, and so forth. Um, and more recently, and really since COVID and the energy prices have escalated, that we've seen the uh, domestic market uh, really pick up. And um, so we've got quite a quite a large team, quite a big work order book, but I guess um, we're not seeking to be the 200 hectare type operators. We're ultimately owned by A, a community, and a community trust, and B, a, a lines company. And so our interest in this space in particular is working with agribusinesses to future-proof rural communities, rural economies, and uh, we're conscious that with the decarbonisation, particularly of um, uh the transportation sector, what that will mean for a rural network resiliency and making sure that, uh, I guess, rural communities aren't left behind. Um, ultimately, there's only so much uh, electrons that can flow through the poles and wires. So the more that we can be there to support rural infrastructure, the better in our view. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so so we were engaged uh, with Tambo, obviously, to, to look at a couple of pilot um, examples in the Canterbury region. Um, these are just a, a few sort of high level um, considerations that we thought were worth mentioning that were that were played out in the report. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the dual land use of agro tax does require additional design considerations. Uh, when we say design considerations, it's effectively code for cost. Um, so where that really uh, matters is where it largely comes down to um, looking at the delta, uh, the difference between um, having sheep and having cattle and, and, and dairy farms for that matter. So um, anything is possible, but it all comes at a cost. And, and I saw a couple of questions float through um, in the Q&A relating to floodplains or areas susceptible to floods. Uh, we are building in floodplains, uh, mainly in, in Northland as well. And so... Um, the same sort of logic applies that we can raise the panel height. Uh, it just comes with additional considerations for extra um, extra seal, extra materials. Um, there's extra wind loading when you're up higher, which has uh, 
additional sort of knock-on effects in terms of the structural integrity. So um, it's all possible, comes at a price, um, but ultimately um, that's where the sort of difference we see between the um, attractiveness between uh, running sheep and running cattle uh, and plays out in terms of the economics that, uh, that have been provided in the report. Um, sorry, just go back one slide. Um, thank you. Um, the, so those primary land use requirements will dictate how attractive it is from a sort of um, cost perspective. Um, irrigation is, is in the same sort of bucket. It is possible, but it, it can get a bit bitsy and, and costly. Um, but ultimately, what we've found uh, in our own experience and through uh, work with Tambo is that, um, you know, the the proximity and the capacity of that local network that you're seeking to connect into is, is, is a major um, dictator of what the scale of that farm will be. So those larger ones that um, Catherine mentioned are probably connecting into the transpower, sort of 110 or 220 kilovolt, um, the large large um, transmission towers, whereas most farms um, are typically connected to 11 kV sort of um, distribution networks who can typically take a solar farm of anywhere from sort of one hectare to five hectares or so. Um, and that's kind of the footprint that we've that have been somewhat looking at in the Tambo case. Uh, case. Um, ultimately, what that means, which I'll dive into a bit later, is how that commercial model stacks up. Uh, does it make sense? Uh, and given the appetite of the farmer to to take on that sort of project, or is that a third party's uh, uh, opportunity? Um, ultimately, I think these are the things that uh, the key to unlock the agrivoltaic opportunity in New Zealand. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so the next couple of slides are just a quick snapshot of um, the, the dairy farm and the sheep and beef, looking at the pros and cons at a very high level. Um, for both, we did look at what the different design configurations could do and could mean from a sort of doing a fixed tilt, which is typically north facing, versus um, a tracking system which moves uh, to follow the sun, which is east west facing. Um, I guess important thing to note is probably the cover ratio which um, um, which is a little bit uh, higher for the the dairy farm um, which obviously speaks to the the higher higher opportunity cost of that land use you know per dollars a hectare operating profits for dairy is typically higher than sheep and beef so um, that's that's I guess from a um, solar developer's perspective they'll look to um, tuck as much solar into their into that hectare to make sure that you're getting the uh, economics to work for the solar. Um, and so then that really comes down to what what part of that dairy farm can we um, can we use, which has a, I guess, is ideally closer to the network, but ultimately of lower commercial value to the farmer. Um, so that I guess there's more room to move with regards to the extra cost that dual use uh, dictates. Um, yeah, I won't go into the details, but happy to field in questions. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, sheep and beef much more promising based on the um, um, assumption that uh, any agrivoltaics is just using sheep. So I guess at high level, um, little if any design additional con design considerations are needed to run sheep for a solar farm, uh, which is great. And I, I think um, probably if I was going to Take a guess, roughly half or so of the solar farms that are going through consent or have been consented um, are probably um, using sheep as the um, as a vegetation clearance operator, if you can call it that, uh, which which is probably a sort of future emerging commercial opportunity uh, in itself. Um, I guess with sheep and beef in general, the connection capacity uh, is generally lower than that of um, intensive dairy. So the ability to have a larger um, solar farm is a bit more limited in general. Um, in this case, it, it was you know we we did manage to find a five hectare site that we think should be able to fit into the local network. Um, but ultimately, the economics uh, and the cover ratio um, is more um, supportive of, of sheep farming than than dairy. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to delve into this in a bit more detail, but I guess this, you know, it, it kind of raises the question, um, anything's possible, uh, what commercial model is the best fit? And 
I guess our view as a solar developer um, is technically you can build anything. It's just, can you make the commercial model align so that um, everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, really? Uh, so this is just a real snapshot of two different ways that farmers could approach it. You could explore a design and build a typical sort of contract where the farmer owns it. Um, they fund it either directly or, th or through the bank and green loans are available for that um, with um, varying uh, levels of attractiveness. Um, but ultimately, we would highly recommend engaging a third party to build it or, uh, directly or in partnership. Um, I guess the main thing to highlight for the farmer owned system is um, uh, responsibility for that performance and not just performance of um, of the solar farm working, but actually uh, is the farmer willing to take effectively the risk of selling that electricity into the energy market or providing it, um, securing a contract for that. Now those sort of service contracts are available in the market. Um, it's it's just mixture considerations. Uh, I guess the main benefit, which I, I see a couple of questions come from, um, was that uh, the whoever owns the system uh, gains access to the renewable energy certificates that come with that. I don't profess to be an expert in in RECs as they're termed, uh, but that it's obviously um, a, a consideration given the compliance uh, burden that's that's coming down. The other option is the land lease uh, option, which I think you'll see is more common in those larger sites where effectively 150 hectares or so, or, or whatever that value is, is uh, uh, contracted under a, a simple lease contract for typically 20 to 30 plus years. Um, the third party takes care of any of the funding, so there's no requirement for the uh, farmer. And, and that's all sort of uh, delivered uh, without any um, significant impact uh, from the farmer, unless there's certain stipulations in there. And, and that's where we would highly recommend that you have that conversation with that third party to to get the the rights to graze or or other considerations or the rights to uh, advise on where you want the fencing lines to be. Um, and uh, I, I think that some of the learnings that you've seen offshore is that people say agrivoltaics and there's going to be sheep grazing there, but Often there hasn't really been any or limited consideration to where you want the gates, where you want the uh, the um, defence lines, and uh, and that's something maybe that's worth further conversation. Um, I guess on the negative side of things is that um, that comes with um, you know effectively a covenants on on your title. Uh, the third party owner will have rights to the wrecks, but they can be novated uh, subject to that negotiation. Um, and I guess one other thing that's probably important to highlight is that transaction costs um, versus the returns from an order farm perspective. It's a bit messy, but effectively what that speaks to is um, the farms that we've looked at with Tambo are typically connected to the 11 kV line. So they are kind of limited to the sort of maximum five hectare size. So that's a sort of single digit million dollar investment. And what is the appetite for a solar developer to engage in what it, they would consider quite a small project? Um, and for the farmer, it may only be you know a, a small slice of their of their land. And ultimately it comes with the transaction costs. And I think there just needs to be some um, simplicity there to make sure that given the size of the project uh, for both parties to make sure that that's aligned. Um, yeah, next slide, I think it might be my final one. Yeah, so um, just a bit of a wrap up, really. It's all possible uh, under the right conditions and there's some some considerations there from a technical perspective. Um, just to note, the land use, uh, dual land use does result in a trade-off on the design requirements and the and ultimately the installation costs and the economic performance, hence why sheep farming uh, typically comes out better than dairy farming at this stage, although um, there is a lot of work happening off, offshore in the research space to see um, to what level that can be improved. Um, most New Zealand farms are limited from that network connection. Some of you on the call maybe um, you know may have a 33 or a 66, 110 kV line running overhead or nearby, and, and that does present a much more significant opportunity to look at a you know 20 plus hectare type farm. Um, however, we really do think that that 
in our own experience at least that that commercial structure getting that aligned um so that the incentives for both parties um uh, and the business models that fall out of that uh, are significant meaningful enough so that we can really unlock this dual use opportunity in new zealand um yeah that that's me i'm happy to field any questions later but thanks Thanks very much, Russ. That's excellent. Um, and I see there's been a few questions rolling during your presentation. So uh, we'll come back to Chris and um, Catherine at the end, um, and we can address some of those questions then. Finally, uh, we have Ian Hyatt from Ashburton District Council. Ian is a district planning manager, and he's going to talk um, about some of the consenting issues. Uh, from a district council perspective. So I'll hand over to Ian now. Thanks very much. Um, uh, and um, uh, hello, everybody. I guess, um, <laughs> yeah, Catherine's stolen quite a bit of my thunder. Um, she provided a very good overview of the, a lot of the matters I was going to I was going to raise. And so I'm also slightly daunted now that I'm going to be speaking after an RMA lecture and barrister. So I, um, I hope I've got things right. <laughs> um, I guess uh, from my experience, I've been here at Ashburton for quite a while now. Um, just to um, just to to cover off a few things that um, that I've learned, and I guess in a more generalist sense, before I get into my my actual speech and some of the stuff that's been raised, particularly by Catherine, um, it's good. It's a good point that was made about um, early adopters, um, and and I guess just from a practitioner's perspective. Um, perhaps not even so much about renewable energy generation, but just more generally. Council staff will have a degree of caution uh, when things are new and changing. That's certainly an environment we're facing now uh, in any number of ways. Um, and I think it's important that developers and people that are considering developments need to appreciate that councils will be feeling their way as well. So uh, oftentimes I think um, councils are sort of approached as the oracles of, of, of truth and they should, you know, obviously we should know what we're doing, but equally it is all new and we will be con um, confronted by situations that we haven't before. So I think that's a, you know, just, just something that I would mention. Um, I think the other thing to also mention is that count all the council decisions can be judicially reviewed, which is uh, another fancy word for, for legally challenged. So uh, that that's really not a fun process um, if anyone's been involved in it. It, it provides doubt and uncertainty for the applicant. Um, uh, as, as any decision that's that's involved, including something like notification, can be um, can be reviewed and overturned by the court. Um, and, and if that happens, it forces not the project to be abandoned. It's not like an appeal. It's more like um, the fact that that actually that process has to occur again. So fundamentally, if you've had a notification decision that that somebody's challenged and um, uh, and and the courts decided wasn't right that notification exercise needs to be done again. And, and while the court's sort of debating that and while the process is going through, months and years can go by. So that can be a real delay for, for, for a project. Um, and I guess going back to my earlier point, um, it invites caution by the council, which can be frustrating for, for the developer. However, I guess from our perspective, they can help by providing the information that the council needs to help them make a, a solid decision. I'd also admit that it's a double-edged sword um, because the council staff need to be not need to be honest as well, and there needs to be a clear line of communication. And I'm aware that uh, that sometimes that isn't the case, and sometimes it is difficult to get information out of councils. So, um, you know, it's a, it's an evolving process, and it's something that um, you know can be improved um, throughout the country. So just as a bit of a starter for, for where we are and where Ashburton District Council is, we, um, for those that aren't aware, we basically have two types of terrain, very, very simplified. We have hilly and mountainous high country uh, and alluvial uh, plains, which forms part of the wider Canterbury Plain Network. Um, the latter of that has good soils, it's generally flat, and we have good summer sun levels. Uh, because of we also have a, a very wide irrigation network on the plains, we have high demand um, in the summer for, for electricity. Um, basically because we need to move water around when the sun's shining. Um, the other thing Ashburton has is it has a good robust um, electricity supply network um, with what we understand to be relatively good con connectivity. Uh, so it seems to make our district pretty, um, pretty attractive for solar generation. In terms of consents, we approved back in two February 2022 a large uh, 97 hectare solar plant in Lauriston. 
Um, I believe that's now funded. I I'm not entirely sure whether it started com commencement yet, uh, being constructed. It was a slightly smaller one near Mayfield, uh, which is inland from here, uh, also in 2020, early in 2022, uh, which was of about 35 hectares. Um, we've also dealt with a number of smaller on-site systems, which are basically individual farm support systems. Um, they have been reasonably straightforward for us. Um, most of their applications were in 2021 and 2022, uh, predominantly the latter. We haven't had anything this year, uh, which could be a function of where we are in the election cycle and also interest rates uh, or, or any a number of other matters. Um, most of these uh, proposed a continuation of agricultural activities under the plan, under the panels. And that was important before the, even before the uh, MPS uh, on highly productive land came in because our district is always um, and our councillors have always appreciated the value that um, agriculture gives to our economy. Uh, and so it was very, very important that um, the agricultural land wasn't lost um, even before the MPS on highly productive land. So um, I guess going to um, individual councils, they'll have, they'll have rules, as Catherine previously said, which are triggered by solar arrays. For Ashburton District, um, our second generation district plan um, anticipated uh, and, and implemented the um, uh, the NPS on renewable energy. And so we do actually have provision for renewable infrastructure. Where the consents have usually come in in the past has been because buildings for um, renewable infrastructure, uh, energy are uh, utilities and there's a maximum permitted size of five square meters. And, and of course the panel, um, the panels are usually larger than that uh, in their individual forms. So um, it's not been problematic. Um, we've granted the consents. Um, however, as, as is previously said, the, the visual effects um, from neighbors can be a significant concern. And, and I believe that was a significant one for Kia X, Kia X and so on. Um, on that subject, uh, I, I think uh, one thing that I would say um, is in terms of the full notification discussion is that yes, uh, to a large degree, obviously applicants and, and developers would like to avoid notification if they can, but there is actually provision under the Resource Management Act to um, to actually for the applicant to request public notification. Uh, the benefit of that is that it brings uh, the application straight into the notification phase, which can delay or which can avoid a significant amount of delay from uh, councils um, debating on what level of notification is required. The other thing it also does is it takes out of the equation the ability or the potential for judicial review um, of a notification decision. So I wouldn't discount the potential if you're considering these applications and particularly if there is a sense that um, the community might be interested in this of actually um, nominating as an applicant a um, a formal notification process or full notification process. Uh, it does have its advantages in certain instances. Um, so going back to the actual effects, bunding and screening, um, you know, depending on, on the environment, um, they can be very beneficial. They've been beneficial in our, in our developments um, that we've dealt with. But I appreciate they can also be complex as they um, they can't sh shade panels in a way which would reduce the sunlight gaining efficiency of them. Um, most panels are reasonably low level, so um, our our impression is that um, you know the bunding and um, uh, bunding and, and and planting can be can be an efficient way to deal with those issues. So um, the National Policy Statement for Highly Productive Land came into force in September of last year, um, as has previously been discussed. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go through this because um, because I'd already written it. And I think it's probably important to, to, to just sort of, from a practitioner's point of view, to, to sort of go through where, we're, um, where we see it at. So it contained a, a variety of provisions with the overall intention of safeguarding land identified as being highly productive. Uh, it impacts a significant majority of the Canterbury Plains and certainly um, a larger part of the Ashburton District. Um, many of you will be familiar with the transitional maps that, um, that, that are held by regional councils. And, and I just comment that there is a subsequent process to that I think the district uh, the regional councils have, um, let's see, the two or three years to actually uh, finalise the soil maps. Um, and I believe there's a process where um, where 
landowners will be able to comment on whether or not they, they think that's um, their classifications are valid. Um, the NPS re recognises specified infrastructure as previously has been stated, um, and um, it currently only allows the maintenance operation, upgrade or expansion of uh, specified infrastructure. It doesn't refer to the construction of new infrastructure, uh, and it, um, it leaves a conflict between it and other national direction, obviously the, the MPS re, um, renewable energy and, and obviously problems for councils and potential developers. It's just a, it's just an unfortunate, um, uh, unfortunate result of the policy, the way it's worded. The MPS for renewable energy generation is, um, it was just previously been discussed was gazetted in 2011 and, um, provides the justification for solar to be um, consented as uh, specified infrastructure. Um, so earlier this year, there were some um, amendments consulted on um, from the, uh, for the uh, renewable energy MPS. Um, the text in the documents noted um, as a summary that our current resource management settings don't allow us to build the renewable energy infrastructure or electricity infrastructure at the rate needed. And I think that's, you know, that probably sums it up. Uh, the consultation document grappled with issues such as the merits of placing infrastructure in environmentally, geographically, or culturally significant areas, and what, if any, uh, consenting requirements should be put in place when these conflicts occurred. Uh, decisions on this are expected um, next year. So um, then we have the NPS Indigenous Biodiversity, which has been in force only for weeks, um, and which was developed under the supervision of the MFE, Ministry for the Environment. It also has an interesting comment, which I read while preparing for this uh, this presentation. And in this MPS, specified infrastructure, uh, which provides exclusions to the requirements of it, explicitly excludes renewable energy generation assets and activities. Um, and so um, it says renewable energy generation assets and activities and electricity transmission network assets and activities are not specified infrastructure for this national policy statement. So there's a bit of a conflict there, and uh, and I guess, it, it, but what it's doing is it's prior, prioritizing biodiversity over renewable energy. Um, I guess what the reason why I mention it is because it it, it shows that the space is complex and that national priorities for protection, um, uh, for versatile soils, decarbonizing economy, and and protecting the environment are intersecting with legislation. Um, it's being recognised, but it'll be tricky to resolve given existing priorities and competing priorities. So the government's recently uh, commenced a feedback project, and this closes on the 31st of October, um, suggesting the allowance of a path. So this is back to the um, uh, National Policy Statement for Highly Productive Soils um, for solar farms to be permitted um, by including construction into the provisions. And that's where I was talking about before about the... Um, the fact that it's only about maintenance of existing infrastructure, which I think um, Catherine also spoke of. So yeah, uh, I see Megan, I think has just um, has just added to the chat uh, a link to that. I think if you're interested in developing or you're interested in um, the provision of solar farms and you're, um, and you're particularly if you're involved in um, highly productive land, my suggestion is that you do comment uh, on that submission and make your, make your, um, Make your voice known because um, this is the opportunity to potentially get that into um, into legislation. Um, just sort of to finish off, the elections and, and more generally the RMA reform process are adding complexity to to how we do things in the legislative environment, uh, and the direction of how matters will proceed still uncertain. Um, things have changed a lot in the last year, uh, but hopefully, as as the documents settled in and are fine tuned, they'll assist more than hinder our transition both for regulators, landowners and developers. But I think probably what needs to happen is, is just to emphasize how important those lines of communication are, particularly at pre-application stage when projects are being discussed between councils and, and developers, just so that everybody knows where they stand and, and uh, where the uncertainties lie. And I think that'll probably do it for me. Excellent, thanks very much, Ian, that was brilliant. Um, plenty of good information there. Uh, I do see, however, that uh, we've got quite a few questions, so um, might still need a bit of your time to come. So uh, just before we start the questions, I'd just like to um, say a huge thank you to our speakers today. It's uh, been brilliant to get uh, such a, uh, a group of uh, experts in, in a room together, um, or virtually, um, to be able to have some of these conversations. 
So we can now move on to the question and answer um, session. We have had plenty of questions. So first, um, first question up is solar power will uh, no doubt will add income to sheep and beef operations, but does the sheep and beef component add income to the solar power system? Um, and basically the return per hectare from the solar energy generation was greater than the return from the sheep and beef. Um, so in that regard, it's not adding income to the um, solar power system, uh, but we do have those um, dual land use benefits um, of having that, that sort of agri-voltaic system. Um, so for Alan, um, this has uh, come up a couple of times. Uh, are you able to explain how the carbon offset works? Yeah, so again, as Chris said, I'm also an expert in this space, uh, but I just put it I just uh, in the chat. Um, the New Zealand Energy Certificate System is there. So apart from selling the electricity into the wholesale market, you can sell the attributes, the, the, the carbon uh, reduction. Um, as an example, Vic Uni is in a, in a process of doing some carbon offsetting and buying some of these certificates or talking with solar farm developers in buying some of these, these certificates. So it's nothing about necessarily carbon offsetting for the for the farm itself. It's it's selling the carbon offsetting elsewhere in the, in, the, in the economy. I mean, in theory, if you are going to be using the the uh, that uh, energy yourself, yeah, there's potential to to do that. But I haven't. That will be interesting discussion to have with uh, certified uh, um, energy. Maybe just to add, and again, I um, I'm no expert, but uh, for additional context, you know, um, certified energy, it's a volunteer scheme. So there are a couple out there. It's not the ETS though, which is probably the one that uh, might be um, you know hitting the farm at the moment. Um, or soon to be, but um, I am aware that Toitu, uh, another um, another outfit, are uh, looking to uh, see how they can certify that, and that might actually, I'm not not quite sure, but uh, the likes of Fonterra and uh, the large co-ops may be looking to uh, roll out some scheme that perhaps Anna and Tumbo are more across, which could incorporate that. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's directly comparable to the ETS. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, uh, we've got another question here that you might like to address too, and that's around the minimum area for agrivoltaics. Uh, yeah, so um, it's a terrible answer, but there is no real minimum per se. Um, it, you know, it is modular, um, and so it's, um, I guess the maximum is really dictated by what that network connection is. So uh, I think if you're on 11 kV line, that's sort of two to five hectare, and it is a broad range really subject to what the network can can feed down the line. Um, on the lower end, um, it's an economies of scale question. So I would say if, if you're looking to, um, you know, supply the cow shed or something, you, you could do something that's, um, uh, you know, 50 kilowatts, which I can't recall how exactly small that would be, but quite small, um, could feed the, the cow shed um, and then to have something that's network connected, I would recommend that you're looking towards two hectares just from an economies of scale perspective. Uh, that said, people do smaller. Uh, you just have to be a bit more um, pragmatic about your cost structure, I guess. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, moving on to our next question. Um, given that the NPS HPL only allows for expansion, is there any pathway for a new solar farm on highly productive land as it currently stands, assuming it is a discretionary activity or greater under the district plan as well? Or is it best to wait until after the consultation um, has been through? I'm, I'm happy to comment that I think it, if you can wait, they will, they're proposing to explicitly insert the word, you know, the concept of new, um, the new um, uh, infrastructure. 
you know, the specified infrastructure. So, yeah, that would then be an exception and it would be very clear. I think it's still possible to do it under the existing one, but it would certainly be um, safer <laughs> if that goes through and easier if it goes through. Um, uh, the alternative, and this is something that um, uh, Ian raised, um, is lobbying, you know, persuading your council to go for a plan change to get it to be permitted as an activity. Excellent. I think, Thank you. I think just, sorry, if I can just add to that as well. Um, I think um, the the government uh, or the, the ministry, I should say, is actually advocating for that change to occur. So that is their preferred option for that to be inserted. So that gives them just an added degree of confidence, I think, if, if like as Catherine says, if you can afford to wait. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Ian. Um, yeah, great to have you both here to be able to address these questions. Um, we've had a um, question here. Awesome presentation. It's great to see discussion and research on the integration of agrivoltaics with conventional pastoral farming. There seems to be two sides to this. Developers buying farms for conversion to solar farms and landowners who may want to diversify their farming operations to include solar farming as another income stream. What is the appetite with developers for integrating or maintaining the productive farming capacity of land as opposed to just full conversion? And I'll, I'll throw that one at Chris um, first. <laughs> yeah, no, great question. Um, uh, yeah, it probably depends on the developer. I mean, um, at that larger scale, um, yeah, it might be a bit different than what we're looking at, but... Um, yeah, from a solar developer's perspective, it is a lot simpler and cleaner to just do a straight conversion. I think that's pretty clear. Um, that said, you know, there's plenty of developers out there, us among them, that are seeing how we can actually work with farmers as, as a, you know, revenue diversification opportunity rather than a full conversion. Let's get out of farming. I guess ultimately there's, there's a bunch of us out there that don't want to be the next forestry kids on the block. Uh, you know, we want to be able to work with uh, rural communities and farmers to make sure that um, this transition that's happening is, um, yeah, is fair and 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 can yeah support communities more than anything. So yeah, I know that's a sort of Bob each way type answer, but um, yeah, I would I would if you're looking to do that, I would I guess I would recommend shopping around to make sure that you you get the right developer. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I think it's good to um, bring awareness that there you know, are multiple developers and that there are options there. So uh, and another question, how could land owners go about exploring agrivoltaics in more detail? Um, I'm going to do a, um, uh, uh, I guess, a self-referral uh, in, in the first instance to that uh, web page on our project in the first instance. Um, and also we have um, our host of experts here who might be able to uh, add more to that as well. And we do have um, contact details for myself and Alan, and I'm sure um, we might be able to get um, pass some referrals on it also. So is there any indication of how many consented sites have a standard commercial design? Have any been specifically designed to allow farm equipment to operate between rows? And that uh, might be Alan or Chris. Chris, yeah. if you want to make a start. I, I can give sort of direct experience, I guess, and Alan, I'll happily defer to you. But um, we're working um, on a few farms, some that we're owning and some that we're working with a, a large solar developer in the North Island. Um, and, and they're specifically raise the not just uh, raise the um the heights of the piles to enable um grazing uh underneath but they've also spaced uh the rows further apart so that we can get tractors and so forth down there um that said i guess that kind of speaks to the design consideration where if you have a tilted system you you typically can space things out a bit further um but i don't have any specific data to be honest um not sure if you can assist, Alan. Yeah, I, 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 I can't say about how many. Uh, as I said, well, we have an idea about how 
total capacity, but I don't know offhand have, have the number to how many, but yeah, as Chris says, uh, the other, even the, the very big uh, solar farms that are now in various stages of, of development have thought about farming equipment moving around uh, between the panels and, and allowing for, for, for that. So, yeah, it's, uh, I think, you know, New Zealand is different than some other parts of the world. I mean, this is not an Australian outback, so we would just have a huge expanse of land with uh, with a good, good solar resource. So we're going to have to think, and I think that is happening now in the industry. I think Alan's just frozen the honour. So acknowledging that we need to switch off. Sorry to interrupt you, then, Alan. You just froze for a moment. No, I'm I'm, I'm done. Excellent. Um, so what is the potential of situating solar farms on north-facing medium slope land as opposed to flat, often highly productive land? Why is flat land so important? And another question is, what is the maximum slope? Uh, good yep. question. Um, sorry, I could, I'll just jump in quickly from my, and again, a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is it's really a, a bit regarding the, um, the slope tolerances between the tables. So effectively, I think the cutoff is roughly 10 to 15 degrees, if I'm correct. So absolutely north facing, it doesn't need to be flat. It's just effectively cheaper and more cost efficient to do so. But as Alan showed, you can have them vertical if you want. So um, anything's possible. Thanks, Chris. Alan, have you got anything further to add to that? No, I mean... As Chris said, we, and as, as I showed in the slide, we sort of looked at up to two, maybe three percent, and then in, in for analysis, we looked at, looked at less than two percent. But that was plainly to minimise cost, um, and we did sort of factor into the GIS analysis land that is slightly sloped towards the north. But as Chris says, I mean, if, if you have north facing land. And as the question alludes to, you know, that's lower productive land, then absolutely. But it's just, it's going to be a cost issue, uh, or engineering, technical engineering cost issue. Um, yeah, the question here was, I, can't, I don't know what the acronyms are, ONLs and SNAs. Anybody in the panel? A significant natural area. Of uh, yes, we did. We did um, exclude any conservation land or anything like that. Uh, but what the question also was, yeah, so the high value, no, we didn't consider what is highly productive land. We didn't go down to, go to, the, go down to that level. So that's just giving overall, but as I indicated, um, you know, we all, we're only talking about in you know, the order of 40,000 hectares. And so. I'll just interrupt for a moment, Alan. I'm just conscious that not everyone could see that question. So that question was basically, did you map at the beginning? showing lots of red around Canterbury, Taranaki, et cetera, take into account the ONL and the SNAs. Have you done any constraints mapping which excludes areas of high value, noting that most of what you're talking about is low value farmland? So uh, just to provide some context to um, Alan's um, response there. Okay. So in summary, yes, that was, that was all productive land, but it's... Um... Yeah, if, if you consider the, the, the percentage that we're talking about of, of total land, absolutely, you're probably directed to, to low value. Why we did include a high value is for today's webinar, we're talking about, about livestock and so on, um, but there's also horticulture. And what's happening overseas is a lot of attention on horticulture. Uh, certain of uh, certain crops actually do well uh, under panels, like letters, as an example. Uh, so it's there's also benefit of, of looking at high value land. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. So another question here is what was the past growth under the panels and what is this likely to be going forward given continuous shading? So I'd just like to point out that for our particular project, we it was a desktop modeling exercise. Uh, we looked at uh, hypothetical situations and we weren't out collecting pasture growth or quality data. I am aware that Massey University are doing a project looking into that and have um, published some interim results uh, and from memory, and um, I apologize if I get these numbers wrong. I believe um, under the panels, there was a 84% reduction in pasture growth and out in the open, there was actually a 34% increase. 
uh, but don't hold me to um, account on those figures, but I believe it was around that mark, and that was at a Taranaki site. Alan, are you aware of any further detail on that? Uh, only from, from over, overseas. Uh, and yeah, it, it depends on, on what the pasture is and, uh, under it. Um, certainly what we've seen out of Oregon has not been significant. Uh, that has a lot to do with how you design it. And um, yeah, apart from farming equipment, you want to actually increase that spacing between the panels to allow more light under it to, to, to minimize it. But this is ongoing uh, research effort globally uh, to understand what this does to, to plant growth because there's all kinds of, kinds of other things as well. Is uh, like weeds, where we have water runoff from, especially from the fixed tilt uh, systems. Um, we have increased weed growth uh, where the water and we have soil impaction. And so there's all kinds of other things that are currently being investigated. And we need to do that in, a, in our context as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that came through quite a lot in our project and our literature review that um, there, there is very little work um, that has been completed in New Zealand currently on, on those sort of details. So with sites that are already very wet, what is the potential for having large-scale wet lanes directly underneath solar panels? I assume there are regular maintenance requirements which would make this not viable. Perhaps if I throw to this to Chris. Yeah, um, great question. Um, I, I think that, I mean, anything is possible for the right price, but uh, definitely there'd be some reluctance from a solar developer's perspective, A, to be developing something in a wetland, um, and B, to be, um, fostering is the right, wrong word, but uh, basically, um, I think, you know, if you were going to develop in a wetland, you'd probably follow that path. I just think, most solar developers would look to avoid wetlands for um, um, cost and consenting uh, complications, to be honest. Can, can I just um, comment that if you have an existing wetland, that would be very difficult. There would be a lot of consenting complications, you know, um, mm. with the requirements to maintain those. If you were trying to create one, which it seemed to be, if it was already wet and creating a wetland, that's different because then you're adding to, but yes, that's that's the legal requirements completely separate from those technical engineering ones. Yeah, that's a really good point, Catherine. Just to add on that, I mean, we are um, we are building a, a, in some floodplains and it's not um, areas that are constantly wet, but we have raised, for example, the inverters to be um, several metres off the ground in order to um, be able to manage um, the, the periodic floods. So um, it's certainly possible, I guess. Um, it, yeah, just a, a cost consideration, really. Yeah, great. Thank you both for um, responding to that. It's great to get the two different perspectives there. Uh, another question, are you able to please provide revenue comparisons, i.e. return for, per hectare for dairy uh, and sheep versus solar and dairy sheep? Um, I'm going to refer uh, that question to the web page, uh, Tumbo Agrivoltaics page. So, and probably the farmer's booklet has a really good summary of all of that information. And if you're looking for more detail, there's the full report um, further down that page. Um, so what is the recycling plan for the storage batteries and panels once they are at end of life? Is there a risk of contaminations, com sorry, is there a risk of contamination from panels and batteries? Um, I'm happy to um, give my perspective. But Alan, do you want to um, give a sort of broader perspective, potentially? Oh, you're muted, Alan. I'm mute. Uh, yeah. So this is a this is a much discussed issue globally. Uh, so, so first of all, just to say. Uh, this point in time, a lot of the, the 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 solar developments aren't talking about batteries, but they're sort of battery ready, I guess. Uh, but certainly, that's something that you, that you can look at integrating. But while there's an operation, there's been some concerns of of uh, these panels and some materials that can, can be released. Um, but 
the evidence shows with solar farms that have been operating now for quite some time that we don't see the, any toxins or anything. Uh, as long as the maintenance and so on occurs well, then that, that's not an issue. End of life is is, is another matter, right? So uh, if we're going to build a solar farm now, it's going to be operating for at least 30 years. Well, that's 25, 30 years. It's typically what the panels are, are guaranteed for. So at the end of that time, you're going to have to look at, at, at the options. Now, as part of this uh, this project, we sort of looked at what is the situation in, in New Zealand and solar PV panels, as best we could see, sort of classified under electronic waste and needs to deal with, needs to be dealt with in the same way as electronic waste, which is very inexpensive. Uh, but what we've seen now in Australia, they've now reached the interesting point where they have about 450 million tons of PV panels uh, at the end of life. And um, because that's sort of interesting in Australia, they've been using old PV panels as fencing on farms uh, because there's nothing else to do with them. But now they've come to a point where there's enough to now consider a centralized recycling um, center, if you wish, or facility. And yeah, we would have to be, and that, that came out of the project report as well. We're going to have to start thinking in, in the NZ context, what are we going to be do, doing with those panels in the next two or three decades? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and from what uh, we could see, um, and speaking as a farm consultant with limited knowledge, but it looked like um, that planning and thought process needed to get underway sooner rather than later, so we can be ready. Um, another question is, why are you encouraging a pathway for agrivoltaics in the NPS HPL? That national direction is about protecting land for growing crops. No, and I imagine that while crops shed, uh, sorry, that national direction is about protecting land for growing crops. And I imagine that while cows, sheep go well with solar, horticulture doesn't. Should we be looking to change land use on HPL from cropping to meat? Um, I can probably have a, have a go at that one. Certainly the first part of it. Um, my understanding, and, and I wasn't involved in drafting that legislation, but my understanding of the, the NPS highly productive land, part of it was to stop or to limit um, residential expansion into highly productive land. It was it was not fundamentally um, to deal with renewable energy or, or any of that nature. It was it was because of the I guess sprawl is the is the common word that we were getting around the country. Um, so that's the first part of it. But I, I think it's a good point. And um, uh, you know, of course, that's why the public consultation is out there, and, and not everybody will have the same opinion on whether or not um, highly productive land should be used for for renewable energy. Um, there'll be parts of the district, uh, sorry, parts of the country where um, it's suitable outside of um, uh, outside of highly productive land, and there'll be more um, not highly productive land available. So I, I guess that's just another another reason for for everybody to participate in that process and say, you know, what their opinion is. Um, that's what the democratic process is for. Um, so that would be my comment. And, and can I add that I wouldn't say I'm encouraging the pathway necessarily, but we're more commenting on the difficulty in the current HPL is not provided for, and the proposal of the government is to change it in order to provide for it. Um, but yeah, they, they do think for some reason that this is a, a much better use of land than what they were trying to prevent, which was a urban growth and development and not, you know, just completely covering it, removing it forever effectively from uh, agriculture of any sort. And so I don't, it wasn't specifically designed for crops. It was literally the worry that once you build on it, you've removed it forever from any kind of production. Uh, and, you know, once private property rights um, and buildings go on it, people don't usually tend to remove them and turn them back into farms of any type. And so it's more that fear and driver for that. Anyway, I hope yeah. that yeah, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, thanks for that. And I see that uh, Alan might have a comment around the horticulture question there. Yeah, so as I said earlier on, um, horticulture is also uh, being investigated. I put a link there in the chat to Jack's Solar Garden in Colorado. It's the classic global showcase, uh, really. They have a two megawatt tracking system there and a community 
doing all kinds of different crops, tomatoes, letters, uh, etc. So interesting how you set it up in which crop you grow, where, in terms of light, and, and some of the crops do better because they actually get, depending on where you are in a, in a, in a world, and you might argue, well, here we, we are in a higher latitude, that it might not be the case, but uh, they actually get sunstroke, so, so it's actually beneficial. And the, the vertical panels that I uh, showed earlier on, France, in their viticulture sector, have really gone quite a distance down this, because you don't want to have overhead systems necessarily, because you want the sunlight on your on your grapes. But between the, the rows, you could have these, these these vertical panels. So again, different options depending on what kind of operations. And we've even seen on orchards, they lift the panels up to five five meters above the trees, space them out again, uh, different kind of configurations that we don't have time for today. Uh, and apples and pears are doing pretty well. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Alan. It's quite interesting to know um, that, you know, there are other options and um, potential land use options with um, agrivoltaics. So another question is, can you explain more about the difference in fixed and tracking design? Yeah, so I, uh, maybe Chris can explain a bit better than I, but yeah, so with a fixed system, uh, you're going to tilt those those panels at a fixed angle. Uh, the rows are going to run east-west, and you're going to, for us in the southern hemisphere, you're going to face those panels towards the north. And yeah, normally goes with latitude, but sort of 53 degree, whatever your latitude is. Um, having having said that, uh, you also look at your well, depending on what you you want to generate electricity for, but for the wholesale market, you sort of look at the nominal prices over a year. Uh, you look at your solar resource. When do you want to generate uh, the electricity? Uh, and so you might or orientate that tilt uh, more for for the winter or more for for uh, spring and autumn or whatever the case might be. So, but anyway, it, it, it's a fixed tilt. Um, Whereas with tracking, your rows are north, south, and the panels move uh, from east uh, to west. So basically, just following the sun's path uh, over the course of the day. So, uh, whereas you can expect with a, a fixed uh, tilt system, you're going to have sort of a bell curve if there's no, no clouds or whatever the case might be. Uh, if it's a perfect sunny day, you're going to have this bell curve in terms of solar generation. With a tracking system, you're going to reach to, to your max earlier in the day and sort of follow a, a flat path and then sort of reduce towards it. So you're getting more um, uh, more solar generation over the course of the day, but then you have moving systems, so costs become play sort of into that as well. So yeah, these things are almost just balanced with one another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was great. Alan, just, just a couple of things. I think you nailed it, really. But um, tracking systems are a little bit more expensive, but they generate more electricity. So they, they kind of wash out at about the same in terms of dollars a kilowatt hour produced. Um, but uh, solar developers will often make a call based on the, you know, the the O&M sort of requirements and the energy energy trading perspective that Alan mentioned in New Zealand, effectively, uh, electricity demand is higher in the winter, prices are higher. And so in that sense, sometimes uh, developers will choose a fixed tilt, uh, sorry, a tracking system because it gets a bit more production in the winter. Whereas someone operating in Ashburton with the irrigation load might be more interested in something that's sort of peaking in the, in the summer and they may choose a, a, a fixed tilt approach. Excellent, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, so two questions from an agricultural perspective. One, is there an impact from rilling from high rainfall areas, i.e. from the panels? And I think this is what Alan um, referred to in terms of that runoff of the panels and it, um, the soil um, impact underneath that specific site. Uh, so firstly, is there an impact? And then 
if the panels are tilted in different angles, is there less of an issue? And secondly, um, is fertil or how is fertilizer applied in agrivoltaic systems? So if we start with that water runoff question, and then we'll move on to the fertilizer question. Yeah, so as I, as I said, it is, has been a, an issue that has been identified. There's a question whether different angles is not, well, yeah, if you have a higher tool angle, you're going to have a higher impact on, on, on the soil. But there are ways to, to, to mitigate it. So you can, have, you can put in a gutter system, and that might actually be beneficial, right, so to, to cap, capture the water and, and run it off to the, to the sides and into, into tanks and utilize that. Um, well, in terms of uh, how is fertilizer ap applied, I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that one is, <laughs> any, any I can probably help with the, um, the spreading. So we can get the width wide enough that we um, can use ground spreaders. I think one of the key questions we had uh, and we put to both Alan and Chris in our original project was, is there issues around warranty with having those fertilizer particles near the panels? Um, and there was a bit of a question mark around warranty concerns. Perhaps one of you might be able to speak to that. Um, yeah, I can't speak deeply to it, but uh, absolutely, I, I would echo that statement that uh, most of the panel and framing providers that we spoke with weren't particularly comfortable um, and the idea that you're applying fertilizer. Um, so um, I guess it's, it's still a new space and we largely don't know enough, I would say, uh, but it's it's something that probably needs a bit more work, to be honest, uh, to really flesh out what is the ideal approach. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, yeah, probably another one to add to that research list that we'd like to um, see here in New Zealand. So is there a vision to see all farms in New Zealand take on those small scale solar farms, sort of one to five hectares to contribute to the grid network? Um, depends on your perspective, but I think uh, that's a sort of view that we would like to see. Uh, I guess um, not everyone shares that, but ultimately there's, what, 11,000 dairy farms, 30-odd thousand sheep and beef. Um, do we want to see 100 of each convert into huge centralised um, uh, power stations, or do we want to distribute that out amongst the regions? Um, yeah, there's no one right answer, but... Um, I guess different companies are approaching that differently. Excellent. Now, yeah, thanks for that, Chris. And I, I, get, I guess it again um, speaks to the fact that different developers are going to have different um, goals um, and plans. So, um, just keeping an eye on time, we will wrap up at two pm. Uh, we do have uh, another few questions in the meantime. Uh, are we fixated on current transmission availability? versus point source projects, i.e. fuel hydrogen station for transport? Um, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, even in the, so, so from a, from a, and certainly with, with the case studies that we were looking at, uh, the simpler is, is simply to sell it into the wholesale market and et cetera, right? Uh, but having said that, with the agrivoltaic systems, and looking at experience with colleagues uh, down in South America and so on, we are thinking about the farm as a system in, this, in itself. And can you set up that agrivoltaic system to supply some of the, um, the, the farms on their own electricity, uh, including other energy vectors that are needed on the farm? Um, such as fuel uh, mentioned in in, uh, uh, in, in a question, but uh, there's also an option to electrify farm equipment, right? So there's different options there. We've also looked at we were working with the community in Haast, um, looking at hydrogen production and using renewable solar or maybe any other renewable energy resource to do that and what the cost would look like. So yeah, the, the, these are certain options that uh, the question is, uh, or the, uh, speaks to hydrogen as an example. So we, we are getting hydrogen refueling stations. So we have been thinking about, can we rather just focus on supplying those? But the, but 
so far the economics don't really stack up. As I said, it just makes more sense to participate in the in the electricity market if you can. Or have a purchase power agreement uh, with, with somebody to do or take your electricity. Yeah, sure thing. Um, another question we have here is a lot of people are interested in the battery and length of life of solar PV panels. Um, are any of the panelists able to comment on those two topics? Um, I, I can speak, I guess, direct experience at least. Um, we so the typical solar panel warranty is uh, 25 or 30 years these days. Um, when I started in the industry 10 years ago, uh, that was 15 or 20. So things are improving. Um, put it in context, the first, a lot of the first generation of solar panels that were installed even in as late as um, the 80s, are uh, much smaller and less efficient, but uh, are still operating. So um, they do have a, a pretty good life. On the battery side of things, we are in, currently building um, New Zealand's largest battery for a while at least. Uh, in Huntley, it's 16 20 foot containers. They're lithium ion batteries. Um, we've got a 15 year warranty um, for that. Uh, I think generally they come with 10, but depending on the way that you use them, you can get more life out of them. So that's, that's a product warranty and, be, and you typically um, will take a risk based approach on how long you think it will last after that in terms of your financial model. Um, so that's kind of the the picture. And I would say on the energy storage side of things, things are evolving pretty rapidly for different um, chemistries. I think um, sodium-based batteries, things that have less um, sort of rare earth materials will be coming to, the, to market uh, a bit sooner than most people think. And so I think there is a lot of concern, and rightly so, about how you deal with um, end of life of batteries. Um, uh, but I, I think, um, yeah, uh, yeah. My my, con I think it's um, it's not as big a concern as it's made out in the media. But I would say that. So yeah, grain of salt. Yeah, and um, as I said, globally, there's there's quite a bit of attention around how we're going to recycle uh, those batteries. And, and as Chris said, apart from from our conventional view of of, of batteries, there, if you're going stationary. You know, not my mobile, then there are vastly more opportunities um, uh, for, for storage, right? So uh, our colleagues at Canterbury are working on flow batteries, as an example. You put in a flow battery, um, you're pumping fluids around, that battery is going to last you 20, 30 years. You just have to replace it with the electrolyte and so on. So it's, yeah, there's different options. And as Chris says, it's, it's so much development uh, product development going on into the space because everybody knows this is a key issue. Uh, we need to, to address storage at uh, an acceptable cost uh, with uh, as we're going into more intermittent uh, renewals. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, that actually um, brings an end to our questions. I'm just keeping an eye on time also. So we'll wrap up the webinar um, for the day. I'd just like to thank everyone very, very much for their time. Um, speakers, it was great for you to come along and um, be so willing to respond to questions and give those really um, thoughtful presentations. I would also like to thank the attendees um, who have participated, asked some really good questions. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank our Land and Water who uh, provided the funding for this project. Uh, and if there's any um, request for further information, uh, hopefully you've seen the contact details for myself and Alan Brent on the screen uh, and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all very much.